Whenever you are, sir. Thank you. May it please the court. Um, obviously, from the pleadings and review of the record, the court will be aware this is a, a post-judgment modification of custody um, case. Uh, it's the mother's position, uh, who I represent, that the, um, well, to put it generically, this was an extremely, extremely weak case uh, for a, um, a modification. The court made findings that uh, the extraordinary burden necessary to meet uh, the proper standard for a change of custody and modification here, a reversal, uh, had been met. But in fact, as I indicated in my, uh, my brief, if you look at each of these um, findings uh, individually, uh, many of them are not even legally relevant under the, uh, the existing case law. Um, and the, the few, the one or two that might actually uh, lend sufficient weight to the court's findings, um, the court made conclusions, did not make findings, made conclusions, um, for instance, made conclusions that the mother had acted to alienate the minor child uh, without indicating in what way. Was it because of discussions with the child on the child's questioning about what was going on? Was it outright, you know, saying the father's a monster, you should be afraid of him, you know, there was no level of detail given whatsoever. Um, the father's taken the position that the mother's uh, failure to respond to the request for admissions provides sufficient uh, uh, evidentiary support for the court's findings, but uh, as I've indicated, uh, there was both a formal defect in the request for admissions and, uh, again, the request for admissions was admit various conclusions, not various uh, factual allegations. Are those Mr. requests Mark, for I mean, admissions responses basically in the this hearing, the, you know, the, uh, the party seeking custody has got to show that the circumstances have substantially and materially changed, the change was not reasonably contemplated, That's and the child's best interest um, justify changing the custody. Here we had a situation where the father got remarried, had a job that was more flexible, had a, his new wife is very interested in being involved in this child's life. The mother was very much antagonistic about the new mother being involved in the child's life. The mother herself um, had difficulty in being available all the time and it abdicated a lot of her responsibilities to her own mother she was depriving the father of his right of first refusal a lot of times. Um, she was basically um, uh, working to undermine, you know, the child's relationship with the father and the new mother. I mean, it may not be the perfect record in this case, but pretty much the milestones were hit by this evidence. This is the type of thing that causes, a, you know, a, a modification of custody. And in this case, the modification wasn't that great. Pre-modification, the mother had 60%, the father had 40%. The court just flipped it around the other way to 40, 60. And, and perhaps, yes, the court could have done it by a much lesser means by just entering an order, you know, um, uh, telling the mother she has to cooperate, you know, with the father's new ex-wife and, to, you know, to honor his right of first refusal. But this seems pretty much in the wheelhouse of what the judge could do with the record and the facts that were before the judge. Um, and your honor, I would, um, I would assert that if you look at the case law, um, a number of these factors, including the ones the court has just cited, uh, are not even legally relevant, uh, much less um, lending weight. For instance, uh, in this case, the, the final judgment, the original final judgment of paternity in 2013 was on a contested hearing. So the parties didn't agree in the beginning. The original final judgment from 2013 uh, made a finding that the parties were unable to or unwilling to effectively uh, co-parent. Didn't say the, the mother is unwilling to co-parent, said the parents are unwilling to co-parent. Um, subsequently, many of these uh, bases for the change dealt with um, an inability or re, uh, an inability or refusal to communicate um, between the parties. So here's the question. If there is an extraordinary burden to meet in order to modify a prior court order, is that extraordinary burden met by the fact that two parties who 
just finished having a litigated custody determination continue not to get along. Well, under that scenario, you'd never be able to get a modification where parents don't get along, which is in just about every divorce case. So and th- and we that should is- go out of the modification business. <laughs> and, and that is actually the law, Your Honor. If that is yeah. the basis, is the failure of the parties to get along. Uh, I've, I've Isn't started- our standard of review here abuse of discretion? It, it is a heightened abuse of discretion. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah, it is heightened, but it's still an abuse, right? It is, Your Which Honor. Means we got to basically law. find that no reasonable judge would have entered this order. Uh, the court has to find that there are legally uh, cognizable bases for the court's decision and that the court made sufficient findings of fact in the order for the court to be able to figure out what the reason was. Without a transcript, how do we perform that exercise? Um, and Your Honor, I acknowledge that that is, is more difficult. All I can do is to parse each individual finding that the trial court made, as I did, point out which ones are indications that the parties did not communicate well. For instance, the mother didn't give him information about school activities, and yet the order said they were supposed to each obtain their own. Um, so clearly, that may not have been generous on her part. It would have been better if she had done those kind of things. But is that the kind of thing that meets an extraordinary burden to change custody? And and I do acknowledge that I'm parsing each of these elements individually, whereas the trial court is uh, certainly entitled to view them as a whole. But even viewing these as a whole, is this anything more unusual than a normal post-custody case where the parties don't get along? I don't think there's anything normal about family law, but anyway, the, um, the, the father is very specific in his allegations to substantiate what he believes is a change in circumstances by at least six different allegations. And you're, you're trying to get us to guess as to what really occurred when they both testified under oath. Well, Judge Tibbles was there. And if you're asking us to reweigh the evidence, it's not going to happen. So you got to concede there were two people there that testified under oath. And Judge Tibble is not required by law to go by each and every subsection and set that. You didn't move or whoever represented them below didn't move for rehearing, didn't move for clarification or anything. They were happy. As far as we're concerned, they were happy with his order. So on its face, show me where the error is without supposition. Um, Well, Your Honor, there's this. There were specific allegations. That was in his petition, not in the final judgment. We can assume there was testimony on each of these issues, but the law requires the judge not to make individual findings as to each of the 61133 factors, but sufficient findings to enable the court to determine if its ruling was correct. The rulings made by the judge in this case, and by the way, uh, the mother was pro se, the father was represented, and I was not approached until after the time for rehearing had had elapsed. So, um, but again, if she chose to represent herself, I acknowledge that she had the obligation to, you know, present her case and to do what she needed to do. Um, However, if the court enters an order and says, I find that uh the the extraordinary burden was met um the mother coughed in the father's face and therefore i'm changing custody i think the court would agree that's not enough that's not enough to let us really know what's happened you can't assume unless you're going to reverse zedeker which says there even if there is competent substantial evidence assumed as there is in this case to support the court's decision you still have to show uh, that the extraordinary burden was met here. The, the, uh, the indicia of uh, the court's intention, the trial court's um, uh, decision to make the change of custody that is listed in the, uh, the final judgment, we assert do not meet the level of providing an extraordinary uh, change in circumstance. For instance, um, the mother preferred the grandmother to, to uh, pick up the child after, uh, after school as opposed to allowing the stepmother to pick up the child after school. 
Is that a legitimate decision a parent can make? Or is that the kind of decision, if not barred by the final judgment, is that the kind of decision that can revolt, result in you losing custody? Because you don't volunteer what would otherwise be your time uh, to basically a, a different stranger. The, the evidence uh, indicated, um, <laughs> at least in the original or at least in the original final judgment that the mother was living with her, with the grandmother. Um, and that, you know, presumably, or I don't think it would be a stretch to say that the child was probably well bonded with her grandmother. Uh, the child was nine years old, had basically lived with the grandmother and the mother her entire life. Um, the finding that the mother well, had, I mean, didn't the record show the mother had moved out and was now living with her stepsister. Yes, I'm not sure if the record reflected when that happened, but my impression from the record was that that had happened relatively recently okay. uh, before the trial. Okay. Uh, but yes, she was not living there at the time of the, uh, the final hearing. Um, there seems to be a determination by the court that because the mother had the child picked up by and cared for by her mother, the grandmother, as opposed to allowing the stepmother to pick up and care for the child. Well, I think there was that, but as well as she, she, the right of first refusal for the father even to have a chance in his now newly flexible job, mm -hmm. that was never provided. So yeah, the stepmother is one side of that coin, but the other side is the father was never given a chance either. Yes, Your Honor. And unfortunately, we don't know. Um, I yeah. guess we have to assume that that was substantial. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, have to right. we don't know. Excuse me for just a second. I apologize. Technology is wonderful. My recording <laughs> machine will not turn off um, yeah. unless I unplug yeah. it. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so there is there is uh, legitimately uh, looking at this, this argument, a finding that there was a re failure to provide um, a right of first refusal. There was no details. Um, was this one time? Was this many times? Uh, the court, I think, could legitimately view this as, well, we have to assume it's many times because it was mentioned by the court. But again, it would be um, far superior if the court gave us enough reasoning um, saying that the right of first refusal was not always honored. Would this court uphold a reversal of custody if that happened one time in nine years or one time in six years? Or would it be more likely to do that if it had happened five times a week for the last six years? Well, the problem is, is as Judge LeBritt has pointed out, is we don't have a transcript in this case. So we really don't. All we know is what we can read from the court's order. You know, so we don't and we can't, as Judge Sleet has said, go in and reweigh this evidence and, and try to suppose what did or did not happen. You know, that's that's the tough part about a case with no transcript. Yes, Your Honor. Um, it's our position, however, that because we do have the case law that uh, indicates, and that's the Marino case, the Kyle case cited in my in my uh, my brief, <clears throat> particularly when you have one party who had custody, who's pro se, who lost, there is an obligation to have sufficient findings in that order so that on review, this court can decide, uh, was there sufficient evidence to, um, to uphold this extraordinary burden? Otherwise, you might as well not have the extraordinary burden. I mean, and that's the case law. We do have the extraordinary burden. Um, so our position is, if you take this final judgment and you run it through the appropriate case law, that there need to be sufficient facts uh, so that the court can uphold the, uh, the decision that uh, it's not a competent substantial evidence standard uh, under Z uh, Zedeker, um, that the court uh, has certain areas which have already been uh, presumptively deemed not relevant by the court, by the case law, like failure to get along, like buying a new house, like getting remarried. There are cases that say each of those things is legally irrelevant to the potential of um, a, a modification of custody. Is uh, mayor obtaining a more flexible job sufficient by itself? There's no case law that says that it is. Um, and, and it would seem like in view of the case law dealing that new homes, new marriages, new jobs 
that none of those is even legally relevant. Um, getting a new job that allows more flexibility is great, but is that extraordinary? Is that extraordinary? And if the court made a finding that yes, it is, dad used to have a really bad job that he had to travel a lot. He just wasn't available. Now he can be there 50-50. Great. Then we have the finding that we can pin, but it's the trial judge's obligation, uh, I would assert under the, uh, the case law, to put those findings in. It, it appears well, it's hard to tell. There's no evidence of who prepared this order. Uh, you know, it's not even titled. Um, was this prepared by the judge? Was this prepared by opposing counsel? Um, judge Tibbles. So you know you're into your rebuttal time, but it's your time. You can use it however you want. Thank you. Um, it would it would seem because Judge Tibbles has a long history of of uh, you know being a judge and being a family law judge. Um, I think that there would be some indication that this may have been something submitted to the court. I can't prove it. Um, but it should have been more factually, uh, dis more factually explicit. As it is, it's our position that it fails to demonstrate that the, the proper standard of review uh, was met by the trial court, notwithstanding the, uh, the addition of the magic words that the extraordinary burden was met. Um, and finally, I would just argue that, uh, you know, if this kind of case will uphold a modification of custody, then look for a flood of litigation, because there's nothing here that is unusual. That, that's our position. And I'll reserve my remaining time. Thank you. Okay. You're going to have about three minutes left when you get back. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dodds? Yes, good morning, Your Honors, and if it may please the court, I'm Lisa Ann Dodds, and I'm here on behalf of Appley, Mr. J. Granger. Um, I'd like to start with the uh, point about certain, certain statements or facts not qualifying as a substantial material change, uh, such as a parent's job change or purchasing a new house, etc., while those things may not in and of themselves constitute a substantial material change, those were issues that were listed specifically that went to the best interest factors, not the substantial change factors. Um, and to circle back to the final judgment and the statement made in the final judgment about the inability to co-parent, um, the final judgment in the record has the last paragraph on the first page. I, uh, I, I can pull up the site in a minute. It's, I'm sorry, 186 through 204. Um, in that final judgment on the very first page where it discusses the uh, parents' inability to communicate, it states that the parents have a difficulty communicating, comma, to that end, comma. Then it goes on to say that they should use our family wizard in order to correct that. So it's our position that, number one, the our family wizard and the final judgment stating that they had an ability to co-parent effectively we believe that that means that issue hasn't been rushed to Dakota. So um, additionally, there is a distinction between a failure to co-parent between the parties and a complete and utter stance to not co-parent between the parties. As it was reflected in the answer by the appellant, she had stated point blank that she wanted to retain ultimate decision-making authority. She never had ultimate decision-making authority. She vested that into herself. And upon vesting it into herself, she decided that she no longer had to include the father in any of the decisions. She also, as reflected by the record, she also decided unilaterally that that also meant that she had the ability to withhold information that father was unable to obtain on his own. Um, for example, it stated uh, mother would cancel doctor's appointments uh, or change doctors. Well, how is a father Dodds, going to... But, but yes. what about your, your opponent's very well-argued position that at the time these parties were originally divorced in the final hearing, it was abundantly clear they could not co-parent. Not one couldn't co-parent. They both could not co-parent. This is just more of the same. Is this extraordinary? It's yes, just the same you. old story, just a different chapter. It's, it may seem that way, Your Honor. And um, at first blush, it, it absolutely would seem that way. However, as when you view the record in the, when you view the record in the aggregate, 
you can see that not only did the mother fail to participate in most of the uh, most of the modification proceedings, she also put forth no evidence at the hearing. Um, why is this important? Because it's well, not. We have no a, idea what evidence was put it, forward at the hearing because we don't have a transcript. So. Yes, all we have is the evidence sheet, which yeah. had the request for admissions, but. Also in her answer, she put forth that she doesn't have to co-parent. So it's not an inability of the parties to co-parent and talk. It is the dug my heels in. I don't have to listen anymore. One party refusing to co-parent, which I would state the case law says is very different. Um, furthermore, when a parent decides that they no longer want to act within their child's best interest, this is absolutely substantial material and unforeseen. Because when shared parental responsibility is awarded in a final judgment, that assumes that the parties have the ability to co-parent. The great so, tragedy about whether it's unforeseen about parents not acting in the best interest of their children those of us who are veterans of this war know that is not only is it foreseen, it's more common than is, I mean, it's just ridiculously common. But. I would absolutely agree, Judge Morris. It, it's, it should be less common, however, it's not. But to that end, a, another substantial and extraordinary change of circumstances also lied in the fact that the mother had expressly advocated all of her parental responsibility and for the most part, most of her time sharing to her own mother, denying the father the right of first refusal and allowing the child's maternal grandmother to make all of the choices for schools, for doctors, for education, therefore even further circumventing any need to talk to the father about decisions. Um, Furthermore, it was also stated that there was parental alienation of involving the child in the litigation. Um, to What's that also end interesting is even though this, there was this abdication of all this authority to the grandmother, we know that the mother moved out of the house with the grandmother. Well, I'd like we to- We don't know why, but there's a lot to that. You know. I would like to honestly correct that um, okay. fact. It's- um, it's in the record between the two uh, between the two complaints because they had to be amended. But at one point, the mother did move out and moved in with her uh, sister, and then she moved I back think it was in with her mother. Sister, wasn't it? It's I, I think it was her sister, but she okay. she was at the time of the final hearing. She had been uh, mother had been living with her own mother for I want to say back to another one and a half one and a half years. Okay, so she came back. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know. <clears throat> and further, the final hearing was held uh, at the time when COVID was at its fullest. So um, the minor child was doing e-learning and homeschooling. And um, of course, one of the factors that was um, discussed in the final judgment was that the mother had chosen that she was going to select somebody who's less um, less inclined, less educated to facilitate the e-learning just because she said so. So these are all things that I would suggest the final judgment um, has highlighted and pointed out. And I would also suggest that if you look at the record in the aggregate, we can see that from day one of filing the supplemental petition in 2017, all of the mother's responses, she actually admits most of the things that are contained in the final judgment. So between the answers to the petitions, the request for admissions being admitted, and the unknown testimony submitted at trial, it would be our position that the father did meet his extraordinary burden, as Judge Tibbles did find. <clears throat> um, one quick thing, I know we talked about Zedeker. Um, I'd like to say that, yes, uh, there's a lot of great points in Zedeker, which are on uh, point, but one, one issue that I do make believe that it's distinguishable from the present case has to do with the testimony uh, from prior to the dissolution and the point that the evidence presented by the husband on the issue was in the form of expert testimony that was all that was issued in the uh, all that was presented in the Zedeker case to support the father's position it was all prior stuff prior to the final judgment and then a third party psychiatrist uh, I'm sorry, marriage therapist, who wasn't privy to the information that would have been relevant for a modification. 
So with that, do your honors have any further questions? Thank you very much. Yes, well, thank you, Your Honor. At this time, we'd like to respectfully request that uh, Your Honors affirm the decision and allow Mr. Granger to continue to have time with his daughter. Mr. Newmayer, you have three minutes. Thank you very much, Your Honor. I, I just have uh, four quick bullet points. Um, uh, one, and I apologize, this is not exactly rebuttal, but the court had said, um, you know, there was a change from 60 40 to 40, 60. It was actually um, almost 65% um, if you do the, the calculations. So it's an extra 10% uh, disparity, not 10, it's uh, almost 30, uh, uh, not 20% difference, it's almost 30% difference. Um, I would ask the court, uh, counsel indicates that the mother basically admitted most of the allegations. If you look at her answer, um, she actually doesn't. Uh, she, she takes issue with a number of them. Um, well, one concern I do have is she admits to discussing the litigation with an eight-year-old by describing the eight-year-old as curious. Well, that's, we'll take judicial notice of that, but I mean, being pro se, she obviously does not know the legal ramifications of that admission. So once again, I know you have a tough road to hoe, but we've got a lady admitting that she's discussing this with an eight-year-old. I, I think that's what second or third grade now um that's a problem yes absolutely your honor and i wish we had more detail which we don't and the burdens on us that uh, the court should assume that things are there again uh, that is mentioned in her answer um and, and that's all i have to to go on uh final point i want to make in this case is this the effect of this court order is to transfer primary majority time sharing from one parent who has difficulty in co-parenting to a different parent that has difficulty in co-parenting. That's res judicata from the first judgment. So is that really going to have any effect in the best interest of the child? Uh, I, would, I would assert that sanding the edges of the earlier order by saying, yes, the stepmother can be left with the child alone. Neither the stepmother nor the grandmother constitute child care providers that the right of first refusal would uh, assert to. Ma'am, you need to forward the information, even if he has the right to uh, receive it itself. None of those corrections are in this order. Those are left problems ongoing. Um, so it's our position that not only is this order erroneous, but it doesn't address the issues that caused the litigation in the first place. Whereas a proper order that modified the judgment in, in a lesser way uh, could and would have addressed those specific issues. Um, so we would ask again that the court uh, reverse this final judgment and remand it for reinstatement of the prior, uh, the prior order. Thank you very much. Um, Your Honor, you're muted, I'm sorry. Some of my best work is when I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say is thank you. I appreciate you all very much. And what I really uh, was thinking about, I was listening to both of you argue today. You both have a very nice delivery. It's nice yes, to work with you. Okay. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you both. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs>